Good morning. Today is the fourth Sunday of Easter, also known as Good Shepherd Sunday, so it is uh, awesome to gather in God's house with you this morning. So because it's the fourth Sunday of Easter, hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, hallelujah. Uh, I want to, as we, before we begin the service this morning, I've got the blue microphone here, uh, Patrick. Uh, Pastor Paul Klopke, recently installed, Voice of Care Ministry Facilitator, uh, most recently also, um, Night to Shine coordinator, and also here on behalf of what well, he's going to tell you more, Connection Ministries. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Pastor Troy and Pastor Luke. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited uh, with uh, uh, things and how they're moving here at St. John, in, um, especially in, in the area of people who have disabilities, along with their caregivers. And uh, so it's an honor and a privilege for me to speak on behalf of what I'd like to launch here at um, St. John. It's called Connection Ministries. But before I tell you about that, I want to tell you a little bit about my experiences working in Northern Illinois with Voice of Care. Um, Voice of Care put on these uh, handicaps. And at the camp, my first camp, uh, the, one of the counselors came up to me and said, uh, do you have a camp name? And I said, no, I don't have a camp name. But they can just call me Pastor Paul. Oh, no, we've got to give you a camp name, and by the end of camp, you'll have your special camp name. So the counselors have all kinds of camp names, peanut butter, wedge, cheesy, um, all kinds of really goofy names. And uh, so uh, the camp went on, and by the end of the week, um, well, during the week, uh, one of the campers, uh, she couldn't pronounce my name. Instead of uh, Pastor Paul, it was basketball. <laughs> and, and she knew uh, she was um, playing with me a little bit because she would say basketball, bounce, bounce, bounce. <laughs> so she, she got it. Um, it's my goal here uh, to, to help you with the night to shines which we've had a very successful night to shines here at St. John, but then launch into more than just having a night to shine once a year to partner with uh, an organization called Connection Ministries. It's been around for quite a while. At one time, it was Lutheran Disabilities Ministry, and then it was Sunrise, and now it's Connection Ministries, and it, it's, 
This Connection Ministries is a way to help congregations to launch a, a special needs ministry in, in, in churches. Uh, 14 different ones are in the Indianapolis area. Many of them are Lutheran churches. So I'm asking you um, to share my joy. Um, when I was called basketball, that got me hooked. And uh, I want you to share in that joy. And I invite you to, to uh, come to a meeting that's going to be at Trinity Lutheran Church. We're going to partner with Trinity in Indianapolis for these uh, summer friendship gatherings. And uh, it's three nights a week. And you get to partner up, companion with um, some of the special uh, needs people. Um, there's many roles that you can fill. You can help out with uh, the food, the music, um, or just being there and partnering with uh, the group. Uh, June 15th, 16th, and 17th of this year is where we're going to have it at Trinity. And like I said, I'd like to have one here eventually here at St. John the following summer. That's my goal. And uh, so I would like for, uh, to invite you to come to a special meeting tomorrow night at Trinity. Uh, that's June, what, um, not June, <laughs> April what, 26th? Yeah, at 6.30 uh, at Trinity. Uh, please come. Um, Don Bowden, who is here, could you please stand, Don? Uh, Don is the guy that uh, leads these, helps congregations leads these group and he'll he'll be uh, telling you more about that at the, the meeting on Monday so thank you all right so now we know not only to call you pastor Paul or basketball so uh, what an awesome thing so now at this time I invite you to stand as we join together for the invo invocation and our opening song in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our first song, O oh, Praise Him.
awesome thing to know and confess to saying that God is holy, but also we acknowledge that in and of ourselves we are not holy. But good news, we're in the right place for unholy people to be gathered together by a good shepherd who lays down his life to purify us, to make us clean and holy, to give us life. So we continue now with the confession of sins. I am the good shepherd, says the Lord. Let us confess our sins to God so that, calling upon the name of the Lord, we may be forgiven and dwell eternally with him. Almighty and merciful God, I confess that I have lived as if God did not matter and as if I mattered more. I have not let his love have its way with me, and so my love for others has failed. There are many whom I have hurt, and many whom I have failed to help. I've sinned against God and against my brothers and sisters. For the sake of Jesus Christ, I implore you, O God, to forgive my sins and lead me in the paths of righteousness that I may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son, Jesus, the good shepherd, to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we join together now in singing One Thing Remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. And it's higher than the mountains that I face. 
and it's stronger than the power of the grave and it's constant in the trials and the change this one thing remains and it's higher than the mountains that I face, and it's stronger than the power of the grave, and it's constant in the trial and the change, this one thing remains, this one thing remains. never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. And on and on and on and on and on. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul And I'll never ever have to be afraid This one thing remains This one thing remains Your love never fails, it never gives up it never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. In death, in life, I'm confident covered by the power of your rhythm. My death is pain. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me, your love. And on and on and on and on it goes, yes it overwhelms and satisfies my soul, and I'll never ever have to be your It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. Your love. Let us pray. Almighty God, merciful and loving Father, on this Good Shepherd Sunday, we rejoice that you have wakened from death the shepherd of your sheep. And we pray that as you have poured out your Holy Spirit, that when we hear the voice of our shepherd Jesus, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. We pray these things through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
The first reading for this fourth Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 4. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes, and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem, with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all were her, who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is, no sal there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Before I read the epistle lesson, uh, I'm going to share with you a psalm that I think will be familiar, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Our epistle lesson, also the basis for today's sermon, comes from 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand now in honor of the words of Christ from the Holy Gospel according to the Holy Gospel of St. John, the 10th chapter, also known as the Good Shepherd chapter. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, 
because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our Good Shepherd. Amen. All you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love, love. Love is all you need. Thus the Beatles proclaimed, all you need is love, there you go. Now I like the Beatles and all you, need, all you Need Is Love is a catchy song, but what is this song actually about? What do John Lennon's lyrics actually mean? What does he mean by love? Now I don't usually go to pop songs looking for a whole lot of depth and meaning, especially love songs. But everything is theologically, and I'm genuinely curious as to what lies behind such lyrics. I'll tell you, though, if you read the lyrics of All You Need Is Love, you'll find that they don't really communicate much of anything. The word love is used over 60 times in the song, but the song doesn't do much in the way of defining or describing what love is. If all we need is love, then what exactly is this love they're singing about? What is love? Love is a word that's thrown around a lot. Pop culture and social media use the term constantly. It's used all the time in song lyrics and hashtags. It's used everywhere. Love, love, love. But what does it mean? What is love? The other day I went for a walk and I saw a Virginia license plate that said, Virginia is for lovers. Okay, that sounds nice but it's pretty easy to throw out a simple hashtag or catchphrase about love. Love is love. I can make some informed guesses as to what a hashtag or song lyric might mean by love, but still, my question remains. What is meant by love? The trouble is when lyrics and hashtags throw out the term love, it's often left to the individual to define what is meant by love. And those definitions of love are usually shaped by how the world defines love. And the world's definitions of love are constantly changing. The way in which love is usually used, it's often reduced to sentiments. It's used to describe good feelings, to to just be nice. Crassly, love is often a mild way of talking about lust and sex. Love is also used as a way to demand or enforce acceptance and tolerance. This is how the world defines love. And how the world defines love is at odds with how God defines love. For for love, the way the world defines it really isn't love. It's actually an idol. Twisting love into what we want it to be instead of what God says it is. Love as an idol is a God that we've fashioned into our own image. We've taken love and turned it into what we want it to be. We've turned it into what makes us feel good. We've shaped it into a kind of status where because we love, we've propped ourselves up above those who hate. We've reduced love to mere feelings where we'll love others as long as it makes us feel good. We've turned love into an economic exchange where we'll love as long as the other person loves us back and loves us in the way we want them to love us. We've translated love to mean lust, where we can use the bodies of whoever we want for whatever selfish desires we want. We fashion love into a mechanism that affirms and condones our sinful behaviors. And to say otherwise isn't love, but is hate. Indeed, we've made love into an idol, a God made in our image. When we worship these false gods of love, phrases like, all you need is love, become liturgical phrases of worship of these false gods. Love twisted into a false god isn't love. 
It's sin. Love as an idol promises life, but in the end, it delivers death. Indeed, the world's many definitions of love are at odds with how God defines love. And in the church, within Christianity, we use the word love a lot too. God is love, for God so loved the world. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire narrative arc of the Bible is about God's love for his creation. Jesus' mission to this world is one born out of love for a fallen creation. The life of God's people is shaped first by his love for them and then their love for God and for their neighbors. Christianity is all about love. But again, I must ask, what is love? Perhaps because we use the word so much, we may glaze over what it actually means. Also, we are constantly impacted by the world and how it defines love. We would be naive to think that we are safe or immune from the world's idolatry of love. Plus, how we use the word love in English easily waters it down, waters down its meaning. We use the same word in different contexts with different levels of importance. I love God. I love my family. I really love pepperoni pizza. Maybe not in that order. Love definitely loses much of its impact and importance simply in our usage of the word. Now I've spent the last several minutes talking about love to highlight what a confused mess the term love actually is. The way we speak it in everyday language, the way the world defines it, the way pop songs so cavalierly use it, makes love a rather nebulous and, honestly, a hollowed out and empty term. If love is left to each of us to define it individually, if the world's definitions of love are constantly changing, if love is really a term emptied of any real meaning, then how can we ever talk about love? How can we actually love? How can we ever know what love really is? Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the good news is, is that we don't have to define what love is. Love has already been, de been defined for us, and we know what love is. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. God is the one who has already defined love, and in his epistle, St. John is asserting that Christians actually know what this love is. It is Christ laying down his life for us in his death upon the cross. This is love. This is how we know that God is love. This is how God so loved the world. On this Good Shepherd Sunday, we confess Jesus to be our Good Shepherd, the shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. It is through this great act of love, of dying on the cross for our sake, that we know what love is. Jesus' death and resurrection are the lens through which we, as the church, see, know, understand, and practice love. God has poured out his love for us in and through his son, Jesus. The author of life gave us his life. The author of life died that we might live. This, this is love. This is God's love that never fails. God's definition of love is free from any worldly baggage pertaining to love. God's definition of love is revealed to us in and through Jesus in his great act of love, namely his death and resurrection. And for us, those who are God's children, we have been directly connected to Jesus' great act of love. In your baptism, you were personally connected to Jesus' great act of love for you, his death and his resurrection. Through your baptism, God now abides in you. You have received his unconditional love for you, the forgiveness of your sins and salvation from death. It's a love that is proclaimed to you through God's word and Christ's absolution of your sins. It's a love that you will eat and drink in a few moments, given and shed for you. This is the great love that God has given you. This is the love that you know by faith. And we can only know this love through faith in Christ. 
Apart from faith, we cannot know God or his great love for us. And faith is a big theme throughout 1 John. Although the author never uses the word faith. Instead, he uses words like believe and know and abide. In this short letter, the term abide appears over 20 times. And three of those are in our text for today. In the context of 1 John, to abide means to endure, remain, and stay. So when God abides with his children, he endures, remains, and stays with them. And conversely, God's children need to abide with God. They need to endure, remain, and stay with him. So abide is a faith term. God abides with those in whom he has given faith. And those who have faith in God need to abide in him. Those in whom God abides know what love is because they know God's love. Those who abide in God know his love and are then enabled to love others because of the great love that they have received. For another big theme throughout 1 John is that of love. Love defined by and through Jesus. John repeatedly encourages his hearers, those who are God's children, to love God and one another. And one way in which John repeatedly exhorts love for God and neighbor is through his frequent encouragement to obey God's commandments. The term commandment pops up at least 14 times in the epistle, including four times in today's text. God's commands, of course, are a shorthand description of the Ten Commandments, where God instructs us to love him with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. So throughout this epistle, John intimately connects the love we received from God to love for others. He says this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. In other words, for the Christian, we can't separate our faith in God from our loving our neighbors. Christians are, in a way, a conduit of God's love given toward other people. And lest we're tempted to think John is using love here in a very generic way, that is, a broad command to just, to just love people, John dives into what this love we receive from God looks like when we love others. For one, John is very specific as to who we're supposed to love. When John proclaims that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers, brothers is a specific refer reference to other Christians. Yes, Christians are called to love all people, but here John is commending us to love specifically our brothers and sisters in the faith. John is, is exhorting us to love those within our church. If you look to your right and to your left, those who you see are who John is commanding us, commanding you to love. Those for whom we are to lay down our lives. Which leads us to another point about the kind of love John is encouraging here. It's the kind of love modeled after Christ's love for us, where we lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Those in whom God abides must love their brothers and sisters in the faith. Those who abide in God must love their brothers and sisters by laying down their lives for them. Our love for one another must be that where we are willing to lay down our lives for each other. Now, we are rarely called to literally lay down our lives for one another, and thank goodness that is the case. But we are, however, called to give our lives for one another in the lesser, everyday things of life. This is what John is getting at when he declares. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Our love for, for each other is not reduced to pop songs, hashtags, or platitudes. It's a love conveyed in deed and truth, shaped by Jesus' love for us, flowing from our faith in Jesus. We, you and I, members of St. John Lutheran Church, are called to lay down our lives for one another. We do this in the everyday things of life. We do this when we care for each other, especially 
when it's very difficult and we don't really want to. We do this when we must repeatedly bear with one another's faults and weaknesses that frustrate and annoy us to no end. We do this when we bite our tongue, when we want to lash out against each other, when we shut our mouths, when we want to gossip about each other, when we put the best construction on each other's actions instead of the worst construction, when we refuse to resent others when we disagree with them, when we are not easily offended by one another's remarks, when we ask for forgiveness, when we have wronged our brothers and sisters, and when we forgive when our brothers and sisters have wronged us. Love requires us to lay down our lives for one another. Now I doubt John Lennon had any of this in mind when he penned, all you need is love. For whatever he meant by love, he said that, it's easy. Love actually isn't easy. Love, as God defines it, is hard work. It literally killed Jesus. And so through our love, shaped by Christ, the Spirit is constantly putting our sinful natures to death. It's hard work. It doesn't always feel good. Sometimes it's, it hurts and it's costly. But this is the high calling God's children are called to. Anyone can throw out a hashtag about love. Christians are called to lay down their lives for one another. And this is the adventure of the Christian life. And it's not always painful toil and labor. Through Christ, there really can be peace and joy in our love for one another. There's goodness and beauty in our daily laying down our lives for each other. The love that God continually pours into us enables and empowers us to love one another. And we're not called out, called to live this love out alone. We have the encouragement in the fellowship of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have the Holy Spirit abiding in us, strengthening us, and enabling us to lay down our lives for one another. Because he connects us to and points us to the one who laid down his life for us, who has shown us and given us his great love, Jesus our good shepherd. So, is love all you need? Well, love from and defined by Christ. And at the risk of being a little cheesy, but truthful, all you need is Christ. Christ is all you need. Amen. Now may the peace and love of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our good shepherd. Amen. Please rise, we continue now with the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
As always, it is a blessing to gather together in our Father's house uh, to receive the gifts that we are given in and through Jesus Christ. Um, please fill out the card in the seat backs, letting us know that you're here in worship. Thank you, as always, for your financial contributions, your tithes and offerings, if you've contributed, whether you've done that online or in the uh, container at the back in the narthex. Uh, we continue now with the prayer of the church. Let's join together uh, for prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you are the shepherd of your people, Israel. And in and through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have sought out your sheep and gathered us with them into your flock. We pray that you would keep us always in your sheepfold, that you would guard us from every wolf and snare. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, as you breathe new life into the world through the resurrection of your Son, so now by your Holy Spirit, breathe new life into your church that, freed by his gospel, we may always confess the name of Jesus Christ, the only name given among men by which we must be saved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, your Son has called us to love our brothers, so turn us in love toward the neighbors closest to us, especially those within our own homes, that each day we might show our confidence in you, God, our Heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ, our Good Shepherd, both in our actions and in our words, that we would lay down our lives as Christ Jesus did first for us. Lord, in your mercy, eternal Lord, through the Paschal Lamb, you have brought peace between man and God. And we pray for good government, that you would grant peace and good days also to our citizens and also between the nations of the world that we and all of our neighbors might lead quiet lives in godly contentment. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, Heavenly Father, by the first fruits of Christ's life from the dead, you secured forgiveness for our troubled consciences. So we pray that you would bless and give peace to all those who have any need, whether it be of body or spirit or mind, we pray for the well-being for those who suffer among us and who have requested our prayers. For Jerry, who is anticipating surgery this coming week. For those who are fighting cancer, Larry and Kathy, Jim, Rick, Tom, Paul, Rebecca, and all those that we lift up before your throne of grace. Those who have health concerns, we pray this week for Steve Wilson's sister. Those who uh, mourn uh, the death of those they love, and yet we rejoice, Good Shepherd, that you hold your sheep close to you. And this week especially, we lift up Amy Watkins and her family as she mourns the death of her father, Pete, and yet we rejoice that Pete is with uh, the Good Shepherd and those sheep uh, close to him. We pray for all those in our community and those friends and families. We pray specifically for Renee Howell, uh, all those who have requested our prayers, those who serve in our military and who protect us at home, uh, those who are first responders who serve in all the many vocations you've given. This week specifically, Lord, we also pray that you would bless and keep the ministries of Voice of Care and Connection Ministries as we seek to, uh, as they seek to, and we seek to reach out to those uh, among us who have um, specific need and in, in, and, and special needs. We pray that you would give aid not only in this moment, but even more so, we trust, Lord, that you give immortal life and health in the world to come. Lord, in your mercy, O oh Lord, our shepherd, you calm all fears in this valley of the shadow of death, and you prepare the holy table of your son's testament in the presence of our enemies. And so as we come today to your altar, grant us repentant and faithful hearts, that in every tribulation or sin that besets us, lead us to find comfort and strength in your overflowing mercy given here in this sacrament. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, out of your fatherly goodness, you have remembered us, poor miserable sinners, and given your beloved son Jesus to be our shepherd. So not only to nourish us by his word, but also to defend us from sin and death and the devil. Give us your Holy Spirit that even as this shepherd knows us and helps us in every affliction, we also may know him and trust him, seek help and comfort in him, heartily obey his voice, uh, trusting that we have life eternal in and through him. We pray these things in and through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who also has taught us to pray and we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Pastor Luke, all, all you need is Christ. Christ is all you need. And so you get Christ Jesus here in, with, and under the bread and the wine. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
This eating and drinking of Christ's body and blood strengthen you and preserve you in both body and soul unto life everlasting. Depart in the peace of Jesus, the good shepherd. Amen. Please stand for prayer. We thank you, Almighty God, that as we have come before this altar today, that you have refreshed us through the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that in faith we can confess the one thing needful, that he remains in the midst of a world where change and chance is all around. His love for us is faithful, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So as we leave this place, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, we pray that you would strengthen our faith toward you, but also our love toward one another. We pray these things in and through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, our Good Shepherd, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing song. God is on the move. Anytime a heart turns from darkness to light, anytime temptation comes and someone stands to buy, anytime somebody lives to serve and not be served, I know, I know, I know. Turns from darkness to light. Anytime temptation comes and 